Good morning, church. We are continuing our study of Romans and at last have reached the 12th chapter, Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> where we will be considering all of verses 1 and 2, and actually we'll only cover verse 1 this morning. So we're making big strides. So if you found your way to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, I would ask you to join me as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather together as your people this morning. We can feel fall in the air. We know that the leaves are about to change. And Father, we come here praying that you would bring change in us. May your word have its perfect work in each and every one of us this morning. And with that in mind, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear that you would give us hearts to believe the truth because it is the truth that sets people free. God, we do pray for the one who preaches this morning. His sins are many like all of ours are. We pray that you would get him out of the way, hide him behind the cross of Christ and the power of your word, that you might have an effectual time with your people this morning. We have sung to you, prayed to you, confessed our sins to you, confessed our faith to you, now it's time for you to speak to us through your word, and we pray that you would, that we might leave here not just challenged, but changed, not just confronted, but conformed to the image of him with whom we have to do, even Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may remember the man who entered the monastery to become a monk and the caveat, the conditions were he was to take an oath of silence and allowed only to speak two words every 10 years. 10 years later, the chief monk came to him and said, it's your turn, to which he thought about it and he said, bed hard. <laughs> now, 10 years later, again, it's your turn to speak, food stinks. Ten years later, 30 years, it's your turn to speak, and he says, I quit. <laughs> to which the senior monk said, it doesn't surprise me at all. All you've been doing is complaining the last 30 years. <laughs> Since January, maybe you've been complaining because we have been studying verse by verse through the work of God. Eleven amazing chapters. This morning, we come to Romans chapter 12 which may be an answer to your complaining, a major shift occurs in Paul's epistle to the Romans. It is beginning in Romans chapter 12 all the way to the end of the epistle that Paul moves from 11 chapters of explaining to now beginning in chapter 12 to exhorting. From explaining to exhorting. From doctrine to our duty. From God's revelation to us to our response to God. I'm going to use the actual words, the correct words. They may be new words to you, but write them down. Get familiar with them. They'll help. They're not all that complicated. But in the study of Scripture in theological worlds, we talk about several kinds of verb moods. In particular, this morning, what is referred to as the indicative, and secondly, the imperative. The indicative and the imperative. Now, these are not the only two moods, a verb moods in the Greek language, New Testament Greek, but they are important moods for you and I to understand, the indicative and the imperative. What is an indicative? An indicative is a statement of fact. It's not calling for response, it's just a statement of fact. It's an indicative. And in particular, they are statements of fact 
about God and about what God has done. The indicative. And the indicative always is followed by the imperative, which is a command. How we as believers are to respond to the fact, to the indicative. The imperative is a command that is a response to the fact, to the indicative. For example, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, here's the fact. Here is the indicative. It says this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's a fact. Everybody say amen. That God, in fact, was in Christ, came to earth, became carnate in order to reconcile the world to himself. That's the indicative. What is the imperative? What is the command? What are we to do about this? Verse 20, next verse, therefore be reconciled to God. The, com- the fact, God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. The command, be reconciled to God. The indicative, what God has done. The imperative, what I must then do. Sometimes, many Christians, all they ever hear preached are imperatives, commands. That's all you hear from the pulpit. Read your Bible more, pray more, witness more, and of course, give more. And then on special Sundays, you hear all four of those things preached at the same time. The Bible is clear that we respond and obey based on what God has done. The late Dutch theologian Herman Ritterboss' work, amazing work, entitled Paul, An Outline of His Theology, has an entire section of Paul's use of the indicative and the imperative. And Ritterboss points out that in Paul's epistles, the imperative always rests upon the indicative. The command always rests on the fact. The things that Scripture calls us to obey always rest in something that God has done, is doing, or will do. And this is an essential point to understanding your Bible when you read it. Ritterboss writes this, he says, quote, The indicative and the imperative are both the object of faith. On the one hand, in the uh, the receptiveness of the fact. By faith, we have to believe the fact. We have to believe. It's true. And then he goes on, for this reason, also the obedience to that fact is also by faith. For for this reason, he writes, the connection between the two, the indicative and the imperative, is so close, so indissolvable, that they represent two sides of the same matter, which cannot exist separated from each other, end quote. That is what God claims to have done in his word demands response. And apart from the response, there is no faith in the fact. Rearboss says the imperative, that is, the obedience, is actually our actualizing of the indicative, of the fact. If we believe the fact, our response is sure to follow. Faith, that is, obedience to command, actualizes the fact. Let me give you another example from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says this, therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, this is a fact. As Christians, by our union with Christ, we have been raised up from deadness of sin. Therefore, what's the command? If that's true, that's the fact. The imperative, number one, keep seeking things above where Christ is. Number two, set your minds on things above and not on things on earth. If you truly believe that as a Christian you have been raised up with Christ, then you will truly Obey the command to set your mind on things above and not on things on this earth. Paul's use of imperative commands resting on indicatives, that is facts, permeates the whole of Paul's epistles. To read Paul rightly and correctly, you need to understand this principle. What is unique about Romans, and we're in a study of Romans, we've reached the 12th chapter, is that the indicatives, what God has done, has occupied the first 11 chapters. That's all we've done and looked at since January. 11 chapters of what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. 11 chapters of truth claims. We've looked at them together for a long time. Truth claims about God himself, God's revelation to man, God's 
uh, exposition of the true nature of man and sin, God's wrath, God's impartiality, the inability of the law to save us, the work of the Holy Spirit, what real righteousness is, what about works, what about faith, what about justification, what about mercy. We've looked at the subjects of God's sovereignty, God's love. We've looked at the assurance of adoption, the assurance of eternal life, the assurance of future glorification. We've looked at the subject of Israel and the Gentiles. We've looked at the deep doctrines of election and predestination. I mean, 11 chapters. We have been working our way through the facts, what God has done, is doing, and will do. And now we've reached that point in Romans where the shift occurs. And beginning in Romans 12, Paul moves to our responsibility to those facts. Paul moves from the commands, that is the imperatives, to the obedience and responsibility. As I pray every Sunday morning that we are not just to be challenged, but what? Changed. Not just confronted, but conformed. As one commentator writes, quote, if we take... To heart the truth of the gospel as Paul has presented it, we will have a transformed view that cannot but affect our lives in uncountable ways, end quote. We've all been here. For going on a year has it affected us. You'll notice verse 12, or excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, as Paul makes this shift, begins this this new treatment on our responsibility to this, that it begins with the Greek participle un, which is translated therefore. Chapter 12, verse 1, therefore. Somebody once asked, what's the therefore, therefore? The word un, translated therefore, means accordingly, or these things being so, or in view of all of this, or as a result of all this, or this reason because of all of this, signals a change from facts to responsibility. And by the way, this is not just in Paul. Jesus did this often. Throughout his preaching and teaching, Jesus used un, therefore, to mark responsibility. Let me give you some examples. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, 38, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's a fact. There's a fact. Now comes the the imperative. Therefore, beseech the word of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Therefore, start praying. Or Matthew 10, behold, I send you a sheep in the midst of wolves. There's a fact. To which Jesus said, therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Obedience followed by following a fact. Here's a familiar one. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two of them shall be one flesh. That's a fact. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man, what? Set us on that. Again, back to Romans 12, after 11 chapters of facts, What Paul says in verse 1 is, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so here we have the first command or imperative. And it takes us all the way back to where Paul began in Romans chapter 1, where Paul describes a fact. And the fact is the condition of, of lost man, the condition of lost humanity. In fact, I'd ask you for a minute to put your finger or marker in Romans chapter 12, we'll turn right back there and look at Romans 1 for a minute. Here is the first fact set that Paul gives us in Romans. For Paul, where does the gospel begin? The gospel begins with the truth about human nature, the truth about all of us, our fallenness, our depravity, our Adamic nature. You're in Romans 1, look at verse 21 and following, notice how we are described. Here's the truth about each and every human being, the truth about humanity. Verse 21, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks 
But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, or of birds, or four-footed animals, or crawling creatures. Everybody worships something, but lost humanity worships one thing, does not worship one thing, and that is the true God. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over, hands them over, hands them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God, for what? For a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. This is universal. It has always been, still to this day. Verse 26, for this reason again, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which was unnatural in the same way. Also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their, or, of, of their error. Here's, here's the immorality of our world, which has existed since the beginning of time amongst those who have rejected the truth and embraced the lie. Again, verse 28, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over again. To what? To a depraved mind, a sick mind, to do those things which are not improper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, and wickedness, and greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossipers, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Verse 32, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but give hearty approval, applaud those who practice them. Here's a set of facts. A description of humanity apart from God, apart from grace, apart from salvation. Humanity that did not honor God, a humanity that became futile in speculations, a humanity that is spiritually and, 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 uh, and, and uh, intellectually, et cetera, darkened, idolatrous, given over to impurity, worshipers of everything but God, disobeying parents, dishonoring bodies, giving way to degrading passions, burning with the desires, just plain old depraved. That's chapter one, first set of facts. And by the way, don't think about them, think about yourself. This is true universally for humanity. And if you can't see it, you must be blind. That's chapter one, and then for the next 10 chapters in Romans, Paul describes more facts. These facts, 10 chapters worth, concern what God has done for these people that he's just described in chapter 1. To say it another way, to outline Romans, you could say something like this. Romans 1 describes the old man. Romans 2 through 11 describes the work of God for the old man. And Romans 12 and following, therefore, how God is to make us new men by a new obedience. A new obedience. You can make your way back to Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you, please, to get this. To really get this, own it, grasp it, and see it. And that is this. Just in these first two verses of Romans 12, we have this incredibly vivid picture of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we compare Romans 1, here's the work of God, chapter 2 through chapter 11, and we come to 12, what we see is that gospel that is described in the middle, what do we see? We see God taking fallen humanity from rejecting God in chapter 1 to offering ourselves to God in chapter 12. We see Fallen man taken from a depraved mind, Romans chapter 1, to a renewed mind in Romans chapter 12. From idolatrous worship in Romans 1 to spiritual worship 
in chapter 12. From the misuse of our bodies in Romans 1 to presenting our bodies a living sacrifice to God in Romans 12. From living a life abjectly offensive to God in Romans 1 to that which is holy and acceptable and perfect to God in Romans 12. This is the power of the gospel. Because all that which God has done creates newness of life in the believer. And as Ephesians 2, if you are a Christian, Ephesians 2, Paul says that we are his workmanship. I remember a conversation I had with my predecessor, Dr. Dr. John Grawley. And among among many other things, John had a doctorate of ministry and counseling from Westminster Seminary. He was the director of the Middle Georgia Pastoral Counseling Center in Macon. John had counseled many, 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 many people with a whole host of issues and concerns and all of that. And one day we were sitting at his house and I just asked him, an honest question. I said, John, how successful do you think counseling is? And I can remember to this day, he pulled off his glasses and he went. (laughs) I understood exactly what he was saying without saying a word. Because the truth is that nobody and nothing can change a human heart but God. God certainly uses certain things. He uses counseling. He uses men. He uses preaching. He uses the means of grace. But apart from God, people don't change. I've been doing this a long time. Trust me, apart from God, people don't change. In fact, I would suggest apart from God, people do change. They get worse. You see, it's all about believing the work of God. Uh, My wife's watching kids over there in the back row with some kids. She'll bear witness. I've been doing this a long time. I've preached Romans before, and I've seen Romans change lives, marriages, people. And I've also seen people sit through the same truths and leave, and you look at them 35 years later. Not better. Worse. Worse worse. Only God can change a life. And Paul is describing the very real, dramatic, supernatural power of the truth and of God's work that does change. Romans 1, this is what we all were. And Romans 12, this is, our, this is what we are to be. And so beginning in Romans 12, for the next many weeks, Paul is calling us to live out what God has done in our lives. Paul is calling us to respond to the the incredible work of God, to put on the new man, calling us to a new obedience. And this is really, frankly, where we struggle. This is the battle. This is where the new man discovers the minefield. Because we hear, we read, we want to believe, we try to believe what God has done, and yet we are who we are. We, We are And I am my old self, I have my old patterns, I have my old thoughts, I have my old mouth, my old desires, my old habits, my old sinfulness. Much less outside of myself, you have this world, the enemy, temptation. And even if you, listen, if you're not aware of this battle, you're not in the folds of grace. So I want Paul to allow this to speak freshly to our call to a new obedience. God didn't send his son just to save you from hell. God sent his son to change us. Make no mistake. Jesus is not just our savior. Jesus must be our Lord. So as we look at this, again, may God's word through Paul speak anew to each and every one of us to either renew or remind us of all that is at stake. First of all, I want you to know the urgency in all of this. Notice verse one carefully. Therefore, 
after 11 chapters of doctrine. Therefore, what does he say next? I urge you. I urge you. When do people go to urgent care in the hospital? When they need immediate and serious medical attention. What is urgent care? It is the emergency room. Paul says, I urge you. I urge you. I urge you in the Greek New Testament is actually one word. It's the word parakaleto. Parakaleto is a, a serious, authoritative exhortation. It is to implore somebody, to beseech somebody, literally to beg somebody. I am begging you, Paul says. I'm begging you. After 11 chapters of the overwhelming work of God, Paul, even having said all that, knows. <coughs> he knows how powerful our sin nature is. And he immediately as he launches into this new section, resorts to begging his readers, including us. I beg you. I beg you. I'm begging you. Begging you. It reminds me of Mark chapter 5. I remember when I preached through Mark's gospel, I noticed that all through chapter 5 of Mark, you had the same word, paracleta. There's a lot of begging going on in Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, just this one chapter, you have a legion of demons begging Jesus not to send them into the pit. That same chapter, that same legion of demons begins begging Jesus to send them into the pigs. The horrified people watching all of this are begging Jesus to go somewhere else. You have the recently healed demoniac who is begging that he can go and follow Jesus. And the whole chapter ends just to get an emphasis on what it means to beg, where you have a synagogue official in that same chapter at the end of it named Jairus, a father who comes begging Jesus, begging him, begging him to save his dying daughter. Paul says, I beg you. I beg you. I beg you like a father for his dying daughter's life Therefore, I urge you. Can you imagine if somebody came and whispered in my ear just before I came up here on a Sunday morning and I stood up here and said something like this, something has happened. And it is, here it is, imperative command that you do such and such. In fact, I beg you to do this. What would your response be? I think you'd do it. Everybody say Amen. Paul's saying, I beg you. It's imperative. I beg you. I beg you. I urge you to heed my following instructions. Secondly, not only the urgency, but I want you to notice the means. Again, verse 1, look at it. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, here it is, by the mercies of God. Circle that, the mercies of God. Because Paul has finally named all that he has described in Romans 1 through 11. All of it. And he calls it, all of it, the mercies of God. I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God. The point is, the mercies of God is not just how God has saved us, but rather what God expects from us, how God will change us. And all that Paul is going to call us to do, to respond to, to obey, you'll notice, is by the mercies of God. By, in the Greek, is dia. It means this is the means, this is the way, this is the channel through which you can and will obey God. By the mercies of God. By and through the channel of all that God has done. And so how does real transformation take place in our lives the means isn't found in us the means is found in the work of God as described by Paul 
in the preceding 11 chapters, found in and through the mercies of God. Paul is saying that all that God has done, previous 11 chapters, has set you free from the bondage of sin, and those same mercies God have given you and enabled you and I to live a new life. And we've learned so much about these mercies of God. We've learned that we were foreknown to God before the foundations of the earth. That's the mercies of God. We've learned that Christ came and into this world to atone for our sins. That's the mercies of God. That God has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us more of the mercies of God. That God in his sovereignty has literally called us, effectually called us to Christ, more mercies of God. That God has given us faith, therefore we could be justified before God, in God's eyes, as if we'd never sinned. The mercies of God. And Paul is continuing this power of the mercies of God by calling us to this new life. You remember in Romans 8, where Paul gives sort of this bullet points of the mercies of God. Just listen to him. For we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. That's the mercies of God. To those who have been called according to, his person, uh, according to his purpose, God's mercy. Those whom he foreknew, God's mercies. He also predestined, God's mercies. <clears throat> to be conformed to the image of the Son, God's mercies. That we would be the firstborn among many brethren. These whom he predestined, God's mercies. He also called, God's mercies. These whom he called, he justified, God's mercies. And these whom he justified, he will also glorify more of God's mercies. God has done and done and done and done and done and done, all of which God's mercies, and it, it is those mercies that enable us to become what God wants us to be. And again, the seriousness of this, God isn't playing games. He did all this for you and me, and I can tell you for sure he expects the fruit of all that he has done. So first, the urgency. Second, the means. I want you to notice, thirdly, the command itself. Again, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, here it is, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Here is the first imperative. Here is the first command. Here is the first call for obedience. To do what? To present your bodies, to present your bodies. To present your bodies for what? Last word of verse one, I'm gonna circle another one, this is a big one. To present your bodies what? For worship, for worship. God has done all that he has done towards one end, worship, worship. There are a lot of some good definitions of worship. There are a lot of bad ones. I have a simple one. Worship is what occurs when the creature realizes that he is in the presence of the creator. Maybe to add some meat to those bones, Worship is what occurs when the dark, guilty sinner whose sins have been covered with the precious blood of Christ finds himself or herself in the presence of the God of Scripture and sees firsthand what holiness really means, what God's immensity really is, and what righteousness and, right, uh, and light really look like, and the only possible response to all of that is worship. Worship. What does worship look like? It looks like obedience. Looks like love, looks like praise, looks like adoration, looks like confession of my sin, confession of God's greatness and holiness. Again, allow me to repeat this. When the dark, guilty sinner whose sins have been covered by the precious blood of Christ finds himself in the immense presence of holy God, the God of Scripture, and sees firsthand the holiness and brilliance and majesty of God, God's immensity and transcendence, his omnipotence, his omniscience, all of it, and sees divine righteousness, divine light, piercing. I don't think our first impulse would be to pick up a tambourine and start banging on it. I don't think our first impulse would, let's put together a the theatrical presentation or whatever. Whatever. 
I do think our first impulse would be to bow low, and I mean really low. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, verse 1 again, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Not the bodies of Old Testament sacrifices, but living sacrifice. Present yourself. I was remembering years back when I performed the wedding for my youngest son here in town or in our area, and it happened, of course, to be a really rainy day. And, of all things, an outdoor wedding reception, all of that. And just to make things better, my car became demon-possessed, and I was sitting in it trying to roll down the passenger seat window, or roll up the passenger seat window. I would roll it up, and it would roll itself down. I would roll it up, and it would roll down again. I would talk nice to it, and it'd still come back down. I'd curse at it, and it'd still come back down. I think to myself, I don't need this going on today. And somebody once said the problem with a living sacrifice is what? It keeps wanting to crawl down from the altar. That's our battle. That's our battle. I want you to notice the first command, the verb, verse one, to present, to present. It's a compound word. It literally means, you know, in opposition to my window, it means to take your stand, to intentionally yield yourself, to present. The intentional yielding of our body to God, and by body it means all of you. My mouth, my eyes, my mind, it's everything from mentally, emotionally, sexually, physically, all of you. And it is this idea of all of you that verse one says is acceptable to God. No compartmentalizing of ourselves. I'll give God this, but I like this sin too much, I'm gonna hang on to it. That's not acceptable to God. I think maybe the most important thing I'm going to say is right now. You'll notice at the end of verse 1, it says this, that presenting your body is that which is, here it is, your spiritual service of worship. Your spiritual service of worship. Would you say those words with me? Your spiritual service of worship. Now, some of you are in a version of the Bible where it doesn't say your spiritual service of worship. It says your reasonable service of worship. Anybody's translation say that? Nobody. Yeah, a few. That's not a bad translation. Because the word there translated spiritual apparently in most of your Bibles and reasonable in some of your Bibles is the Greek word logikos. Logikos. What does that mean? What kind of worship is God looking for? The word logikos means reasonable. It means rational. It means cogent, logical, sound. It involves lucid thinking. It involves sound discernment and judgment. It's worship that is judicious and measured, disciplined and aware. And from where will this go? And next week we're going to get to verse 2, I promise. But quickly, glance at verse 2. With that in mind, what does Paul say? He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. How does God want to be worshipped? He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped. Spiritual service of worship, reasonable service of worship, rational, cogent, logical, understanding the scriptures, thinking lucidly, discerning and judging from the scriptures, measured, aware of the scriptures, worshiped in according to what his word declares about himself, what his word declares about what he has done, 
The fact is, and you can't separate it, that true worship is intensely theological. Your worship, your God, will never extend beyond what you know about him, what you believe about him, who he is. If he's just the man upstairs, you'll worship a so-called God as if he's only the man upstairs. But if you know God according to how God has revealed himself, the deeper and better, more intensely that you know God, it will change your worship. Again, it reads something like this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, I urge you, I beg you, through and by the mercies of God, to present willingly your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable, that is according to the truth, service of worship. Again, worship, according to this verse, isn't erratic. It isn't going through the motions It isn't frenzied, emotive, ecstatic stuff. Spiritual worship is deeply, biblically informed truth about God. Acceptable worship isn't to be dumbed down. It certainly isn't to be entertainment. It isn't to be man-centered. It isn't just a bunch of noise. It isn't just an emotional outbreak. Acceptable worship flows out of a mind filled with the truth of God. I'm a Presbyterian, and as Presbyterians know, we've often been referred to as the frozen chosen. Are we frozen? Maybe in the sense that we are seized, captured, arrested by the truth of God. Worship. I'm going to close with this. The Bible, interestingly, actually gives us a very small handful of accounts that describe a man who encounters God. I'm going to read three and then we'll close, I promise. The first occurs with, of all people, Moses. And I want you to see the awareness of God's transcendence. Exodus 3. Now Moses, verse 1, was pastoring a flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not being burned up. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to Moses from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of Isaac, what was Moses' response? It says this, then Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. An awareness of God's transcendence. That's what the Bible tells us. The next man is the prophet Isaiah, a familiar account, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, they covered their face from God, just like Moses. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called out to another, antiphonally, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the Jerusalem temple, this massive complex, began trembling at the voice of him who called out. And the temple was being filled with smoke. And then Isaiah responds in verse 5. What does he say? Woe is me. For I am ruined. Literally, I am undone. I am unraveling. 
disintegrating. I am disintegrating. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You know what he's saying there? If I can see God, guess what? God can see me. I am undone. A third encounter. Not Moses, not Isaiah, but the Apostle John. The Apostle John who repeatedly claimed to be the one whom Jesus loved. The one who laid his head on the breast of Jesus during the, command, during the first communion. This is the Apostle John. Beloved. Revelation 1, John says, And I turned to see the voice that would speak with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man. Only this time clothed with a robe reaching his feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in the furnace. His voice like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was shining like the sun in all of its strength. Verse 17. <laughs> when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. For Moses, the awareness of God's transcendence. For Isaiah, the awareness of his own sin. For John, the beloved, awareness of God's glory. This is our sacred call to worship. God has done all that God has done and will do all that God will do for one main purpose, that we would worship this God the God of truth. Let's pray together. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we are humble to be yours. The world, much of the world, wants us to deny you and to not believe in you. And unfortunately, most of the church, some of the church, wants to diminish you, make you a friend, remove your transcendence and holiness and righteousness, your power, your glory, your weightiness. But Father, your word calls us to worship you thoughtfully, biblically, filled with truth, truth about who you are and truth about what you have done. Father, I, I, I think of Paul. I think of him after writing those 11 chapters to Roman believers and finally coming to the shift in his book where he moves his attention on to our response, their response, and feels it in his heart the necessity to beg them, to plead with them, to exhort them to worship you according to the truth. Father, may that be the case and continue to be the case at Grace Church. We pray that good, acceptable, and perfect worship would always, always be our goal here. And I pray that what you do here at Grace, Father, would be infectious to not only the churches in our area, but churches everywhere. Um, Father, I think about how important worship is to you, and yet how easily people who claim to be yours can dismiss it, find something better to do, something more exciting to do, don't have enough time during a week to meet once or twice to worship you, but other things are more fun, more lighty, more important, easier than worshiping you. And yet, here Paul stands up and pleads and begs, urges, implores us to the single importance of biblically informed worship. That in fact, there is nothing more important in our lives than this.
And when we come together to do this, Father, help us to do it in a way that is in keeping with the truth. That's, that's my goal this morning, Father. I do pray also as well for somebody here that's never trusted in Christ, never believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, never come to Jesus and bowed before him as a broken sinner with no help apart from Christ. And like Jarius, the father of the daughter, begging Jesus to come and to do in his life what only Jesus can do. If that's you, I, I beg you. I'll beg. I'll resort to begging. I beg you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ so as to be saved. Do business with God because he has done business for you. Again, Father, we pray that you would help us leave here not just challenged but changed, not just confronted but conformed. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you join me as we stand together for the benediction? My brothers and sisters, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his counts on you and give you peace. Amen.